I'd like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators and um, the slide shows you know, my collaborators who have been working with me and particularly um, Kristen Loomis who is the president of the HHV6 Foundation and which was chartered in 2004 and it's still persisting. We just have our ninth international uh, meeting um, uh, last month. The Human Herpes Virus 6 and 7, they are recently addition to the herpes viruses. 6 was discovered in 1986 in Dr. Robert Gallo's laboratory and while we were culturing the blood and the spleen cells from the AIDS patients. So we had, um, all of a sudden, we start to see, as you can see some of the cells were shown there, they become these large cells which start to appear in the culture. And obviously, uh, those cells, when we sent it for electron microscopy, they say it's a herpes virus. And so the question was to characterize it, whether it is any of the known herpes viruses or is it different? So it turned out to be different. It was over 20 years, no herpes virus was discovered. So that was the first one. Soon after that, in 1990, Dr. Frankel, again from NAIDS, reported uh, HSV7 from a healthy individual, the CD4 cells, which were cultured there. Um, the, then the question, uh, what happened was that later on, um, these viruses were, we were looking for whether um, all the different isolates are similar or not. The first experiment which we did was our isolate, the prototype GS, and from CDC and another isolate, Z29, we did look the uh, restriction enzyme pattern on it, and it shows there was a diversity in the two of them. But nobody paid the attention that time. But later when more and more work were done, in 1993, I reported again the polymorphism between these two isolates. And we did the molecular aspect looking at the enzyme pattern, then we looked at the monoclonal antibody, then we looked at the cell culture, and now, then we filed a petition in, in 2010 to the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses that they should be renamed. So our petition was accepted then in 19... Um, uh, 13, they recognized them as two distinct herpes viruses belongs to the beta herpes viruses and the genus aerosola. Um, the viruses are, these viruses are ubiquitous. They're, over 95% of the people have they acquired in the early life. The transmission is horizontal and basically through the respiratory However, um, the unique thing is that uh, there is also a transmission through the germ line of HHV6, and this is, we call the inherited HHV6, which is 1%, 0.1% of the world population in Japan, Europe, here, show that the virus is acquired through the germline from one of the parents there. Um, so the baseline of these 
Um, the, the, the problem we see with these viruses, they are highly cell-associated, and there is cell tropism uh, with at least with HHV7, but not the same thing with HHV6. It's wide variety of cell you can infect it. Um, so this is a new nomenclature uh, of these herpes viruses there that now they are nine herpes viruses instead of eight um, as had been described before there. Um, the, now we start to look for the pathogenesis of these viruses. The first report came in 1988 from Dr. Yamanishi's lab in Japan. They call this three days fever and three days rash, what we call rhodiola. So that's where they showed it and they did the isolation. The first isolation, they reported from it. And then um, we find this is also the primary infection you find in seizures, and some of them become complicated due to the virus, and then becomes encephalitis. You can see in them there. And then we also saw that called the status epilepticus, and where 35% of the children acquire HHB6B, and 9% of the children also have HHB7. So that's another primary infection where we see there. There's some mononeuroclosis also, but it is a very small number between 3-8% um, of the cases which are non-EBV uh, mono, they are HHB6 mono. We have no report of HHB7 mono at present. We do not, uh, don't have it. And the, uh, the sequencing shows that the uh, HHB6 had the up to 170 KB, whereas HHB7 is 145 KB. And um, so there are many, many isolates now and have been reported from there. Now, so these are the, the, the bottom line you see there are where we say, yes, there is virus, there may be a possible association here. And that include the Hashimoto uh, uh, thyroiditis, and we look at uh, Hodgkin disease lymphomas. We uh, have uh, uh, the, in the uh, lupus, we have seen also the virus in the lupin, multiple sclerosis, um, epilepsy, and uh, then uh, we also um, see the some risk of the patient. Um, basically, we see the encephalitis in the um, transplant patients. So some of these, I'm going to show you the, the slide. The first we saw the prevalence of HHV6 in the blood mononuclear cells of the M multiple sclerosis patient. As you can see here, all the eight herpes viruses were described there. But if you look at the six, that is the one which is the highest there we saw. So based on that one, we started to look it into the multiple sclerosis. So this slide showed you here that using the monoclonal antibodies, how we were able to show, we saw in the astrocytes, as you can see there, the dark cells, and on both. And then we also saw in the oligodendritic cell, which is the hallmark cell for the uh, MS. And we also see uh, on the endothelial cells. Um, we also saw that the, uh, the malein protein has the same, the, the DNA sequences of some of the malein protein are identical or also found in the HHV6 DNA. And this is the work was shown first by Dr. Gampo from England and then 
So here is the summary what we are showing is that there is an increase uh, IgM uh, early age which is antigen in the remitting and remissing um, MS, but we also see the uh, the DNA in the spinal fluid of the MS patients, and we all we see there that the predominance is HSV6A, not HSVC. And uh, there's a increase of uh, uh, lymphocyte proliferation. Um, this was done, work done at NIH, that's only with A, not with B. So based on what you're seeing it here, um, the conclusion was that the HHV6 has to do with the multiple sclerosis than HHV6B. Um, here you can uh, see also, we saw the, with the antibodies, uh, the progressive multifocal uh, leuco and subflopathy. And here we can see those two slides showing the, the cells which are positive, they are marked there, they are and we also see there is a combination of HSV6 and the JC virus is co-localized, what you see here um, in the third one, around here. Um, I did a lot of work in the, in the patient with the chronic fatigue syndrome. Obviously, we do not know the etiology at all, at present. There could be a multifocal etiology, but we know one thing, that a subset of multiple sclerosis patients, uh, the chronic fatigue patients, they have HHV6 active infection. And if they are treated, they get better. So here, what you are seeing it here is that there is the plasma on this side, and the other side is the spinal fluid. So this is what we looked at it. So we found 12 out of 35 were positive, the spinal fluid were positive. When we looked at the sequence to find out whether they were A or B, predominantly they were A in the United States. It is not true in Europe, they are finding B more predominant. Um, so there are differences there, but we do know that this particular certain uh, patients who have it and, uh, and the severity of the disease is high, they are treating them with the amplogen, which is the interferon inducer. And then there are other um, drugs now, they are using the, the gancyclovir, the fast carnate, those have been used in there. Um, this is here uh, showing the astrocytes positive there, and they, this is the astrocyte which we have from the, uh, the MTLE. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so just you can see it, there's uh, the measles temple uh, uh, lobe epilepsy, that's the MTLE. This is what we are seeing it there. And so in the epilepsy, what we are seeing is that um, there's the, uh, the surgical specimen which they had taken, there was a high prevalence of high load of the HSV6 uh, DNA, which was of uh, B, not HSV6A. And then also, um, the, the very interesting thing was that 32% um, that, uh, of the uh, 100 a febrile uh, stasis lepticus cases of the primary infection was HSV6B. This was what done the work from the uh, Columbia University, uh, in, and they showed that one there, and also we find there were two proteins, the MCP1 and the GFP, another protein. They were, they were very high, uh, higher in the samples. Those samples which have the HSV6 DNA of that HSV6 DNA B. 
This was what done work in Japan, and the other one was done work by Dr. Meili's lab in China, where she showed the MTL patients uh, positive with a one of the protein, which is the marker protein APOE4 for, for the epilepsy, um, and there was a higher load. The one interesting thing they saw was that if they have the a the APOE4 um, higher positive, and also the HHV6 load of B, they were higher, they had more frequent um, seizures than you will see in the other cases. Um, now, there have been a, since we isolated the virus from mostly from the AIDS patient, and so there have been always a question, does this virus do anything with the AIDS? Uh, so here you're seeing first the CD4 cell, which have been infected, dual infection. And then, very interesting thing, there are certain things we saw that HSV6 activate the LTR of the HIV, and also um, it induces in a receptor, a CD4 receptor in those cells which do not have it by allow them to infect with the HIV. For example, our HSV2 cell, where we grow the virus, and there a, you cannot infect with the HIV. However, if they are infected with the HHV6 first, they get infected with the HIV. Um, then the other evidence came there by Dr. Lusso, where he did a lot of autopsies in AIDS patient there, and he found that but 77% or more of those various organ he checked there, they were HHV6 positive. But the other interesting thing which he saw was uh, that if you inoculate the macaques mama sets with, which, with the SIV, that the simian AIDS virus, and then you inoculate with the HHV6A, our strain GS, with the prototype, the two things he noticed there, one, there was an enhancement of the disease, and there were deaths, whereas the SIV by itself was not doing it. So there's another so evidence here that there is an enhancement of HSV6 in the AIDS patients. We have lot, most of our isolates came from AIDS patients. Um, here you can see the localization of the HHV6 variants in the uh, myocardial uh, tissues. We see heart failure in myocardial cases is due to the two viruses we see in the, in the myocarditis. One is the uh, B19, and second we see is the HHV6. So you can see here that uh, the cells, um, interstitial cells, and they have been um, using the monoclonal antibody to test them. Um, these are, the, again, work by Dr. Um, Professor um, uh, Kruger, where he had done the electromicroscopy on these cells there. And you can see one side. There's an HHV6A, which he uh, finds it, and the, the other one, the HHV6B. And most of the work he did was using the gold staining, and so there are marker antibodies. He could use it to identify there. And uh, there again is a cardiac again. You'll see the cardiac myel myopathy. This is the histology of it, but on, on the bottom you see here on, in the, uh, uh, on the right side here is uh, where we use the antibody and shows that there was infected cells there. So this is another. So there's a big evidence now, and they are treating these patients, actually in Germany, they're taking the heart biopsies 
and testing them for HIV-6, and they are treating, these people are doing very well. Um, now, I wanted to move to show you some of the, um, in the brain tumors. This was what done, the work was done at NAIDS, and, and then where they took the children, as well as adults, brain tumors, and we, these were the uh, glioblastomas and neuroblastomas, and this is where we find, and you can look at here, the graph showed that very high percentage of the glial cell uh, tumors were positive compared to the non-glial. And the, the other evidence uh, in this one uh, came, as you can uh, see, on the bottom one I wanted to show you is the, is the um, there was a study published from China where they found the 75% of the gliomas reported um, and they were HHV6A positive. And they were also able to isolate the virus from the glioma samples there. But uh, so this, this was the first report but at present, we do, do not have another evidence whether uh, these ha can be reproduced there. Because one uh, report which was given at our meeting, they're saying they're not finding A, they're finding B. So there is a controversy there, but definitely there is a virus present there. The most interesting thing was the Hodgkin disease. And, and we started, Professor Kruger and I started looking in the Hodgkin disease, we were able to infect the uh, Hodgkin cells, particularly the, the cell which were carrying the reed Sternberg cell, which is the hallmark cell for it. And so uh, you can, the bottom you can look at is the reed Sternberg cell, which have been found positive with the antibody. So this is the very strong evidence that the nodular sclerosis, Hodgkin, is HHV6 is associated with it. So, and this is came from first laboratory, this evidence came from uh, France and Dr. Rogers' uh, laboratory and where they did, they looked at it by using the, they had a, a DR7 monoclonal antibody, which is an oncoprotein to the ORF1. And uh, so there they showed it that um, um, when they did the staining, but their antibody was made in the rabbit, and they showed that the reed Sternberg cell were positive. And then now, uh, based on this, our foundation have been able to uh, produce the monoclonal antibody, which we have now available. We are giving to people to use it to test for the tumors because this is the oncoprotein to see whether they are seeing it. And so the evidence is coming from this. The, the bottom one I'm showing is, is the evidence from the Yale University from Dr. Handel's lab, lab, and now they also find the evidence in Scotland and in, uh, in Glasgow in Dr. Ruth's uh, uh, Jarrett's lab also. Um, so here you can see the, our major, major problem with these viruses is in the transplants there. And when these viruses are active in the transplants, they in the bone marrow transplants, if it's not controlled, obviously it will reject the graft. And same happens in the kidney transplants, in the liver transplant, and even in the cardiac transplants, if they're doing that. And most of this work, uh, which we following done at the Mayo Clinic, now they're paying attention to these viruses in the transplant, they're also paying attention 
in the University of Washington in Seattle, where they do a lot of transplants. We're doing at the NIH. They're looking and keeping control of these viruses. If you do not control, they will A, reject it. Secondly, there's a pneumonia in these. Thirdly, in these cases also, that they enhance the uh, cytomegalovirus disease. Um, here's the HHV6 again, you see another example in the immune deficiency. And uh, uh, so the red cell you are seeing there, they are the positive cell there. And also you see uh, the HHV6 in the cells uh, by electron microscopy also we have seen. Another evidence, the persistent effects of the lymphotropic herpes viruses, and you are seeing it it's, uh, in the Kashishi syndrome, uh, which is an autoimmune. And obviously, uh, this is where uh, we have the first evidence to show that there was a virus uh, present in these cells there. And uh, so we also, based on the antibodies, we tested it. There were higher antibody in there. Sorry, this I to go back. Um, um, the most fascinating uh, era of HHV6 research is the germline transmission, the inheritance. So, very interesting thing here. You are showing. I'm showing you here. It's, in a common sense, uh, there, the fish analysis, that the virus, it is at the telomeres in the chromosome. And uh, it, it passed on from, uh, this is one family where we, there were four members in this family, two of them, the chromosome 22, but the mother and the son, and where we find this one there. Then there was another, this we reported it a uh, long time ago, but then also there were other families. Now we have evidence, it's all over. So based on this, what it looks like is that 0.1% of the people inherit HHV6. However, this recent study done on 26,000 uh, cases, these are Scottish families, they are showing much higher. They are showing is 1.75%. The lowest one we saw, the CI HHV6, is in Canada, 0.2%. And here in the United States, is 0.8%. And, but it increases. The virus here can be activated. The, uh, so the activated virus, there we see the Enzyma and some other problems with it. So this is the most fascinating field at present. But the question then we asked was, why if six A and B uh, have they are inherited and they are transmitted through the germ line, they are localized and at the telomere can HHV7 can do also. Here you are seeing the picture of HHV7 um, where we also find in the latent and the latent infection, the virus is at the telomeres. However, there is no evidence at present we have that it is inherited. Uh, so that evidence is lacking in this case there. So here's the summary of this one uh, is that approximately 1% of the population uh, harbor the germline HHV6. Because it is transmitted through the germline, the HHV6 genome is present in every nucleated cell in the body. The second evidence you can, beside uh, looking at the blood, the high copy number, um, if you take the nails, extract the DNA from them, it should be present positive there. If you take the hair follicle, it'll be positive. Now, another virus who have the similar 
it can be inherited and it, and it is in the telomere is the Marek's disease virus in the chickens. Uh, so that's, you can see uh, that one, there's another evidence there. HSV6 in the transplant patient be more uh, experience the uh, <clears throat> graft versus the host disease and uh, some bacterial infections are in, they have been noting it in these there. Uh, so, as I said before, there is no evidence HHV7 is inherited uh, or the germline transmission. And CIHHV6A and B are, and there is um, many, many, the data on it. Uh, so, what are the treatments? So, here I'm showing you the antivirals which are FDA approved. They are approved for other herpes viruses, but nothing has been approved for six. But if you look at in the, uh, the activity in the last column there of the uh, acyclovir is not effective. It's effective on the herpes simplex one, VZV, all there, there. And they all target the plumeris. Um, then you can look, you can see here that the uh, Cirqueware is good. We tested that works there. The, then phoscarnate is the excellent. But the problem with the phoscarnate we are finding is it's highly toxic. You cannot give it for a longer period of time. It damaged the kidney. But phoscarnate is very, very potent. Um, the, here the, they are the antivirals here, which are in the process of being approved. And so there's a list there, but if you look at their action um, on the HSV6, some are good, some are excellent, some have no effect. As you can three, see on the three, on, the, on the, the bottom ones, they have no effect on it. And even we see the effect that if the same compound may, may not have the similar effect on A and B. So uh, this is the A area being pursued pretty well. Um, th now these are the compound which are being pursued at present. And so they, they are still being tested. There are no uh, results on it whether they break the blood barrier to reach the septum nervous system or not. Uh, the one I'm showing is the K21, which I will present some data uh, tomorrow. And this is a new antiviral we are working. It is very highly potent. And uh, at present, we have tested them against the envelope, the envelope RNA DNA viruses. And now we are waiting for to go into the animal uh, studies to look whether they will reach the other organs if they are inoculated um, in the mice. Uh, and then we are also uh, trying to do the safety studies so that we can file an application for the FDA for its approval. So the, my conclusions are here that HHV6 Prevalence uh, is uh, throughout the world widespread. Is the eucatus virus there? And we cannot differentiate at present um, the antibody to A and B because there are no tests. We had one test we did in immunoblotting. We targeted the two protein, P100 and P101. P101 was specific for A, B, and 100 was for A. So we tested the roseola patients, the sera. P101 uh, did not show, there were no effect, negative. P101, they were positive. So we know that, that the roseola patients have HHV6B, that is the infection. We do not know the, when the infection of A 
takes place there. But this is later in life, and at present, the only way you can differentiate it by PCR, you cannot differentiate by other ways um, at present. Our amino blood assay was, we could, did not find any A um, specific, even though the SIV macaques, which we inoculated with A, but we tested the sera, they were still reacting uh, with the B. So, um, and the HHB6 could also be very immunosuppressive. And you can see that it has the TNF, alpha, IL-1 beta, and then IL-10, IL-21. Um, then we can also find HHG6B is more common in the lymphonic encephalitis, and this is also immunosuppressed individual. HHV6 A and B have been associated in the pathogenesis of uh, uh, diseases and either directly or indirectly. And so that evidence is still uh, being pursued and there are more and more results coming out, the association. HHV6 is a highly neurotropic and particularly A is more neurotropic than B. We do not know at present much but the, which are the, the most diseases HHV6B, uh, sorry, HHV7 is involved in. Uh, but we saw encephalitis, we saw Caesar with HHV7, we saw also Rosella with HHV7. But that's, uh, we don't know much more of it. In the transplant, but bone marrow stem cell, uh, kidney transplant there, and then these are the one which develop the CMB disease and encephalitis. Um, the inoculation, this is very interesting. We have a model. When we inoculate HHV6A in the, um, uh, the uh, CD46, uh, uh, which is the receptor for HHV6A um, mice, and they develop neurological disorders. They show uh, a very interesting um, in the sense that um, it, the neurological disorder stays much more longer time. Similar thing was seen by Dr. Jacobson's lab at NIIDS, where they inoculated the common mama set with the HHV6A and B. B did not do anything. A produced the a, a, a manifestation similar to the multiple sclerosis. HHV6 can also be detectable in the, um, the PBMCs, the saliva, and spinal fluid in the plasma. However, HHV6A, to our knowledge and to my own experience, we only were able to find in the PBMCs. We never saw it in the saliva. And, um, but in the, when we see the virus in the plasma, and the paper which was published from Dr. Agut's lab in, the, um, in Paris, it says the only time you see HHV6 DNA in the plasma, when the cell degenerate, and then, then the virus comes there, so that's how you find it in the. So if we find the bar, DNA in the plasma, it gives us an, that it is an active infection. So that's what we see that way. And then the detection of HHV6 DNA or antigen in the disease um, tissues, we find the immunohistochemistry is much better than um, using the PCR, because there you can localize the cell where the virus replicating uh, or virus latency. Um, we do not know much about the latency of the virus at present, but there is a unique gene, U94, which is unique to HHV6. 
It's not present in the other herpes viruses. So that's where most of the marker for the latency people are using it, working with it. Uh, so I have um, shown you um, some of the evidence uh, on the diseases where we find HSV6 and we're finding uh, more and more association. Uh, our, we recently found that the mood disorder and also the bipolar disease. We did the, we, the work was done by, in, in Germany and in uh, the UK and where we had the uh, autopsies, brain autopsies, and we have the controlled brain autopsies for another, we are finding 78% of those were positive by three assays, PCR, with the amino histochemistry, and the fish, uh, the in situ. And, and also we looked at the proteins, we find also the Western rock there. How, and the virus there was localized in the Purkinje cells. So that's another area we are looking at it. And my last slide is the acknowledgement to the people from where some of these data have been extracted. Some of his not published at all, and some of his my own, and the other one is from other people who has given me permission, I can use them to show that. Well, thank you.